Today we are joined by another legend from the FBI. This gentleman worked with Robin Dreek, who everybody should be familiar with. Amazing personality, teaches influence, everything else. This is Jack Schaefer, who wrote The Light Switch. And it is a fantastic book on how to influence people, how to essentially build a relationship, albeit up to a friendship, to either collect evidence or establish rapport, uh, many different directions. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And right before we hit went live, we started talking and things get exciting. I've had some previous guests on and they've all worked in the behavioral unit. I'm gonna say behavioral unit because things have shifted over time. But I've had Ken Lanning on, Jim Clemente, Jim Fitzgerald, Robin Drake, Chris Voss. What is the timeline for all these folks? Well, basically, the behavioral analysis unit began with John Douglas. And he first started cataloging and observing behaviors based on criminal criminals and their activities. And they formed what's called the behavioral analysis unit. And their basic job was to go to crime scenes and figure out who did it based on the artifacts at the crime scene. And the B behavioral analysis program split from the BAU. And we pr primarily dealt with uh, suspects or subjects that were known to us. And then what we would do is uh, dissect their personalities, look for vulnerabilities in their personalities, and then develop strategies to interview them or get them to work with us in the case of spies. So the BAU typically did the criminal work and the BAP, the Behavioral Analysis Program, typically worked for the National Security Unit and we uh, usually had a, a suspect in mind and a target that we would work with to try to find strategies to get them to work for us. Okay, interesting. Did you have any kind of overlap, like people that maybe you didn't know uh, for example, Carlos the Jackal, I don't think he was known for a long time exactly who he was, or am I incorrect? No, well, they didn't know who he was, but I, I think that was before our time. The behavioral oh. analysis program started around in the late 80s, early 90s okay. is when it started picking up. And that's when they split off from the BAU because they have the BAU and the BAP have two distinct uh, functions. One is criminal and the other one is national security. So we handle counterterrorism, counterespionage, espionage. Okay, that's fascinating. So is there uh, an investigative element or is it just strictly a recruitment and espionage element? Uh, in, the B, in the behavioral analysis program, we're, we're uh, recruitment. We uh, help people interrogate. We, we assist agents in interrogating spies or potential spies help them recruit people, what are the best ways to handle uh, recruitments or uh, spotting and assessing. So we dealt mostly with the human side and the behavioral analysis unit handled the criminal side. So they, they have two different functions. And when you talk national security, it's not necessarily foreign threats too. From what I understand, you investigated a, an FBI agent at one time who was working a, I guess you'd say a source or informant, and you determined that the relationship may have been closer when you were watching their body language. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That happened in uh, Los Angeles, and I uh, participated in that investigation. So we worked domestic and international, as long as it's okay. within the realm of national security. Now, do you work hand in hand with the CIA? Because I know the CIA is not allowed to do anything if it's a citizen. That's correct. Uh, typically, I worked, uh, most cases that we worked were uh, cases that were domestic. And if we had international cases, we would have to work with the CIA because they have tremendous resources overseas. So in the domestic cases, we did it ourselves. And in the international cases, we work with the CIA and other intelligence agencies, you know, the military. Also have a, a I don't know if it's a liaison or a legal attache group. 
do you work with them too? I know um, I've had Eugene Casey on and he interviewed Carlos the Jackal when he was stationed in uh, Paris, I believe, at, attached to the embassy. Yeah, we, we didn't have much to do with the uh, legal attaches except for they ran liaison leads for us in foreign countries. Other than that, I didn't have okay. any personal interaction with them. All right, well, on the domestic side, and I want to bring it in with Robin, too. I think he has mentioned that he worked the Robert Hansen case. Did you as well, or was that a different time period? That was a different time period for me. I did not work the Robert Hansen case. I was a rookie at the time, and they didn't think oh, uh, wow. I was uh, had enough experience to work the case. Wow. What Are there any cases you can talk about that are particularly high profile that it's safe to name names because, you know, They've already been convicted or whatever. Well, I worked with uh, John. Uh, I worked on, uh, there was a uh, person in Lockheed that was selling stealth technology to a foreign government. We got wind of it, and we set up a double agent operation. In other words, we pretended, or a false flag operation, we, attend, we pretended to be somebody from a different country, and we approached mm -hmm. uh, John Charlton and uh, told him we were interested in buying the, the information that he was selling. And he, we spent about six or eight months on that case, and he turned over a lot of classified information to us, uh, to our undercover agent, and we were subsequently able to uh, prosecute him. And he pled guilty and served some time in prison. That's fascinating. I've had a couple undercover people too, and they were saying that FBI occasionally will own a store of sorts or like a warehouse or they may set up a scenario is that something you're familiar with yeah we we would do that whatever the the, the case requires we would uh set up whatever's necessary to uh, give us the highest probability of success and if that means setting up a front a store or a company then we would do that set up apartments or whatever is required in the case but those are typically with do, do, larger cases. Okay. Do they sometimes last a longer period of time? Like you could, might have a store for, say, 10 years, and it catches multiple people. or it's, it's Yeah, I, a, a, I, I recall uh, a while ago, early in my career, they opened up a uh, storefront, and they were selling uh, stolen goods. So it was a fencing operation. So they would videotape. Uh, everybody that came in to sell uh, stolen property. And at the end of the, a year, I think it was, or a year and a half, they they uh, uh, were able to arrest all the people and they had them on videotape. Is that a problem that you run into where, I, I guess you're not undercover per se, and I know Robin always talks about how he's very straightforward, like day one. He's FBI. He, everybody knows he's FBI, even when he's recruiting. He, he uses relationship building and the rapport skills that you teach to turn people. Whereas undercover people who I've had on have run into problems where they run out of budget or they pull them back where they're not allowed to interact, and then they send them back two, two months later, and that can really mess with the uh, investigation. Yeah, that's why it's a, it's a very complex, when you run undercover operations, people don't realize how complex it is. There's a lot of moving parts. Everything it, everything has to, to be working well. And if one of the pieces doesn't work, then the machine breaks down, the undercover operation breaks down. So you have to have a, a good case agent running the operation to keep everything together. Have you ever done any of these? Yeah, I've done several undercover operations. And uh, it's a lot of work, and you're almost like a director in a movie or a, a play because you, you're in charge of the props. The stage is your undercover theater, and you're, you have props, you have dialogue, you have, you have to recruit the right actors to play the part. So you spend a lot of time screening actors, you know, other undercover agents that you want to make sure they have the right personality, they have language skills, they have the intellect and the knowledge to deal with your undercover target. And then once the operation begins, then you have to be, have surveillance, you have to have counter surveillance, you have to make sure that the, the operation is safe, you have to make sure that 
that your security is maintained that nobody can find out about it so the target won't learn that he's a target of an undercover operation. And then there's always things that go wrong. And you know how the military says, is, you know, you might have a good battle plan, but the first engagement, the battle plan falls apart. First casualty of war is the plan. And I'll tell you a funny story <laughs> about, uh, we had a, actually it was a John Charlton case that we talked about earlier. We were wondering if he would show up with his classified information because we asked him to meet in a hotel room and give us some classified information. And we were wondering, I wonder if he'll show up because we weren't sure he would show up or not. Because sometimes they make promises that they don't keep. So we, you know, a couple of the agents that were running security for him, he said, let's go get some coffee and donuts and we, we have a little time left. And so we were kind of wondering, kind of making bet. Well, some of us said, I bet he shows up. Some of us says, I bet he won't. Those agents came back from the coffee shop and they said, we'll take that bet. And I'll bet the full year's wages that he's going to show up. And I said, what makes you so sure? He says, well, next to the coffee shop was Kinkle's. And we saw him uh, uh, Xeroxing or copying classified information on the Kinkle's machine next to the donut shop. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Talk about coincidence. Out of curiosity, with the Kinkos, can you um, subpoena the Kinkos itself? And, because some of the copy machines actually have hard drives and memory, and every copy that is made through them, you can extract too to further prove he's doing this extra act. We did that, and we were oh, able to. Okay. We were able to prove. <laughs> we were able to prove that he intentionally copied the material. We were able to connect the material he copied with the material he gave us. So we had a good chain of evidence. Oh, perfect. Now I feel smart, thank you. <laughs> well, they do, you, you can, uh, that, you, what, what, typically what we have to do is to cleanse a copy machine, you have to run 10 plain pieces of paper through it to brush it out of the memory because it only keeps it for so long. Right, and now though, memory is so cheap and hard drives, I think they can store like a month yeah, they probably can now, but we're talking back in, uh, well, it was 90, it was in the mid-90s where memory was expensive. So those machines, oh, yeah, they only kept so many pieces, you know, for a limited amount of time, then they'd rewrite it, copy over it. So we were able to obtain it because it was fresh. I remember. Yeah, my, I remember my first gigabyte hard drive, which was just immense. Can you believe it? Over, a th you know, almost a thousand floppies. What are you going to do with that? Yeah. <laughs> Little did we know. <laughs> you got well, more, you got more memory in your watch now. Yes. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it used to be that um, you had more, more computer ability to put somebody on the moon on your phone than they did in NASA at the time. Now it's probably more in the watch. The watch, yeah. And it's 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 getting even more in, incredible what they can do. Now back to your investigation, you had mentioned it was a false flag operation. What is the difference between a false flag operation and a honeypot? Well, a honeypot is when you you take a woman and you you try to develop a relationship with your target. And through that romantic relationship and pillow talk, then uh, information would be uh, revealed because the person's most vulnerable mm. in that situation and they're more likely to divulge information. So a false okay. flag okay. is, in John Charlton's case, he was contacting a foreign government and ask, you know, soliciting you know, to sell classified information. He was selling to stealth technology. And... Uh, mm. What we did was we under, we learned what country he was dealing with, and we got an agent to pretend they were from that country and contact John and say, hey, I'm from that country you sent a letter to. We're here to uh, respond and buy the, we're interested in buying the information. So it's an American FBI agent pretending to be from another country. That's why they say false flag. Okay, now do you run into having to worry about entrapment issues in terms of a defense lawyer coming out. I'm guessing 
in the false flag, you're saying, hey, no, I just put a somebody out there and they had a flag up saying, um, I'll buy stuff if anybody wants it and they volunteer. But how do you navigate that kind of issue? What we do is in consultation with the assistant U.S. attorney that was in charge of this case, assigned to this case, what we would do is uh, ensure that there's no entrapping issues. So we, would, we wouldn't force him to do anything. We would just make the uh, opportunity available to him. And then we would uh, set up situations where he would have to initiate contact to continue mm. the operation. So there was several points during that operation where he could have not contacted our undercover agent, and that would have ceased the trapment. But if he then initiates that con uh, contact after a, a pause in the case, that's not entrapment. And if you set up a couple of those pauses and have them initiate it, so you're sitting around waiting, I wonder if he's going to initiate contact. And it's usually a, a code okay. word or so you a code message. you deliberately ghost them for a minute? Yeah. And then we would wait, you know, and say, here's 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 contact information. Call us if you're interested. So he can always okay. not call us. So when he takes that, init that initiative, that shows that he is not entrapped. Now, that's where you come into play, right, is you have to be setting up this psychological need for him to get back the same way as you did with Vladimir in the newspaper, right? It's exactly what we do. So we do set up psychological uh, uh, scenarios where we, we can kind of set a world in which we want that person to live. So what we do is we, we psychologically develop that world. And then, of course, we can manipulate that world because it's our world that we've, we've developed. So it's, okay, it's a yeah. complex thing. Uh, do you work with um, the material written by Robert Cialdini, for example? Because I saw some definite overlap in there. Oh, absolutely. He's the, the uh, godfather of uh, persuasion. He has developed a lot of principles okay. that uh, are very effective in persuasion. So, yeah, I borrowed a lot of stuff from him as far as the persuasion like, goes like, in behavioral analysis. He's the he's the go-to guy. Okay, yeah, I found that he's the go-to guy for psychological principles of persuasion. Joe Navarro's kind of become the go-to guy for body language. Yeah, I work with Joe. In fact, we co-authored a book, Advanced Interviewing Techniques, and uh, a number of articles. So I, I'm a, a good friend of Joe's. We we were worked on the behavioral analysis program together. Awesome, and you both write for Psychology Today, right? You write, uh, let their words do the talking? Yes, and it's uh, it's just a series of blogs on personal behavior, uh, how to get people to like you, how, elicitation, uh, various aspects of, of human interaction, how to detect deception. Now, your new book, and I haven't gotten into it yet, I'm, I'm making assumptions out there, but are you focusing not only on elicitation, but statement analysis? No, at the, the Truth Detector, which is the, the latest book, is about elicitation, and that is how to get people to tell you the truth and reveal sensitive information without them even knowing they're revealing sensitive information. Because we mm. all want the best out of life. We want the best deals, the best relationships, the best negotiating uh, advantage. And a lot of that information you, you a lot of those uh in order to get the best out of life you need knowledge and a lot of that knowledge is kept sensitive or secret or confidential held close to the chest because then everybody would have the knowledge so it's like sure. it's like a car you, you're going in to negotiate with a car there's a lot of things that go into car uh that that msrp sticker that sticker price on the car mm -hmm. there's a lot going into that there's a lot of negotiating points that you can make. So if you know those things, then you'll, you'll, you'll get the best deal on your car. But they don't tell you those things. So what you have to do is elicit. And I spent some time eliciting from a star salesman from one of the largest car dealerships in the country. And through just casual conversation using elicitation tools, I learned a lot of 
insider information that helps me mm. uh, buy cars. That's awesome. You talked about elicitation in the like switch too. I know um, when you were buying uh, some jewelry for your wife and you've got information out of them. What I love about the angle of truth detection is we spend a lot of time worrying about whether somebody is lying and some legends I've talked to, like Evan um, um Sapir, who brought statement analysis in from Israel, is very focused on saying you don't care about that. You've, you've got to find the truth. And then everything that goes away from that is the problem. And a lot of people are kind of backwards on that. Right. Well, he, he worked. Uh, I, I actually took a number of his courses. And... Uh... Oh, I've subsequently be, uh, learned a lot about statement analysis. I wrote a book, Psychological Narrative Analysis. It's a, uh, oh, professional, a professional method to detect deception in oral and written communications. And that was my specialty in the BAP unit. I uh, analyzed statements, uh, analyzed interro interrogation transcripts, and uh, anything that had to do with the written word. And as an offshoot from that, there's this elicitation technique. Elicitation is a powerful technique because a lot of people spend time trying to detect deception. And mm -hmm. in those cases, people typically know that and they put their shields up. But if you ask people questions, then their shields go up. But elicitation is a, right. it's painless. You don't ask any questions. People will like you and they will thank you after the conversation. And yet they will not they will not have known that they revealed a lot of personal information. It's very powerful for bad guys too, though, right? Uh Kevin Mitnick, uh famous world famous hacker, is probably one of the best social engineers in history. I don't know if he was a great programmer, but he was very good at elicitation and getting people to reveal things so he could hack them. Yeah, and and that's what con con artists use all the time when they steal people's identities. And that's another uh, point we bring bring up in the book is you have to know the techniques people use to get personal information from you in order to protect yourself from being a victim. So there's something called name it and claim it. In other words, if a person comes up to you and talks to you, and then you recognize that technique is something that we re that we talked about in the book. You can say, aha, that's an elicit elicitation technique. That person wants to get my personal information, and that's called the presumptive statement, which is an elicitation technique. That's a presumptive statement. Mm -hmm. You name it, you claim it, and then you protect yourself. Do you do it out loud? No. You, well, typically, you do it inside your head. But one time, I'll tell you what happened once when my, my son was uh, trying to negotiate a deal for a car, and I told him, name name it and claim it so every time the salesman came up with a technique he'd say oh that's a puppy dog that's emotional effects that's this and the and the uh I, I i just did that so he could practice recognizing techniques and saying them out loud and then of course the salesman goes oh, like wow. where are you getting this information from you must know somebody who sells cars <laughs> so but you don't have to you don't have to say it out loud but you know, you have to at least recognize if a stranger comes up to you and asks, doesn't ask questions, but initiates a conversation and you recognize those techniques, presumptive, 30 party perspective, bracketing, one of the techniques we outline in the book, then you could say to yourself, whoa, they're trying to get information from me, sensitive information, mm. and I'm not going to allow it because that's a technique I learned about. I want to name it, claim it, and then you protect yourself. So the book works both ways. It will help you be proactive to get information and it'll help you be reactive or defensive to protect yourself. Because like the the ring, you know, I wanted mm -hmm. to get the best deal on a ring. You have to know the markup, the salesperson's commission, what what are people, will, how low is that uh, merchant willing to go for that ring? And it, And I elicited all that information from the clerk and therefore, I did calculations quickly in my mind, and I said, aha, this is what he'll probably sell the ring for. And then you can get the best deal. So, I mean, you can do it with real estate. You can do it with your kids. You know, oftentimes parents 
want to know what their kids are doing, but the kids are, are a lot of times reluctant to do it. Elicitation is perfect to get your 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 to set up an environment where your child wants to tell you things, not because they have to or they're forced to. They want to because of the environment you set up through through elicitation. You know, bringing all this up, there's something that you could really help with. I've had it come in the comments before from different people who are, let's say, not mechanically inclined, and they are wondering if they take their car to a mechanic and supposedly a repair is done or a series of repairs are done, are there any techniques to find out if the actual repairs were done or were legitimate? What would you recommend as maybe a question and answer path that they could do that could elicit that information? Well, what I generally do is ask for the part. You say that part is bad, show me the part. Take it off the car, replace okay, it, so show me the part. And then that, that 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 typically will let you know whether the part's broken or not. True, true, okay. okay. But the, a better line would be you talk to your, you, you, you interview your mechanic and say, mm -hmm. you ask him questions like, uh, well, I, I'm trying to think of some questions you could ask a mechanic. You could, you could ask him uh, how, how he does things to find out if he's got integrity. Or you could test him by, by saying, this, this, I think this part is bad. And then you can run a, a, what we call vetting. And I've done that once or twice. I went into a, a mechanic and I said, I think that part's broken. You, I think you need to replace it. Good mechanic will come back and say, no, that part's good. There's no replacement necessary. So you vetted what we do with spies. A lot of times before we send them out on the big mission, we always have them do a bunch of little missions to vet them, to make sure that they're, they're being honest with us when they do things and that they can do things. So that's mm. one way you could test a mechanic. Mm. Okay. Do you ever release bad information just to see what, what comes back to you? Yeah. It's called a poison pill. So we want to know how things, uh, how how information is transferred from one person to a foreign government. So what we do is we send out a poison pill, and what that does is that's the only, there's only one person that has informa that information. We give it to another person. Now there's two people that have it. If it shows up anywhere else, it has to come from one of those two people, and it's not coming from us. So it's coming from the guy we gave it to. And so we're able to track information uh, around the world to see who who's handling classified information. So we'll make up classified information. Well, this is all made up stuff. We'll classify it mm -hmm. and then send it out. We'll give it to our supposed, you know, asset. And if it shows up in a foreign government, then we know that he gave it to him and we could track it. Do you ever keep them on? Just deliberately knowing that you can keep pumping in crap information to screw up the enemy? Oh, absolutely. We send a lot of disinformation through our assets. They unwittingly are passing a lot of information to uh, foreign governments that, that kind of mess so them up. So they're so helpful. They well, yeah, even, <laughs> even if, if, there's a lot of things you can do. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit different than working criminal work because you can use a lot more creativity. Yeah, that's true because you don't have to go to court afterward and get accused of entrapment or anything else because I'm guessing a lot of the people you're dealing with, you're never going to arrest or have in custody or anything else. They're either diplomats and probably have some kind of immunity or they're just foreign actors. They just go home and you're never going to get them. Uh, well, I, I can give you a case that I, I brought out in the, I, I, I talked about in the like switch, and that was a, a, a North Korean was in my area of operation, and they suspected him of being a, an agent of North Korea, and hmm. they wanted me to see what I could do with him, see if he, he will work with us as a double agent, or see if he, you know, who he's recruited and what his, his mission is. So he, he opened up a store, a little Photoshop store, and... I used curiosity because I wanted to come. I didn't want to come in undercover because once you break your cover, then you, you, the other person says you lied to me. 
and therefore they don't sure. trust you because sure. you lied to me. So what I did was I set up curiosity. I went to a shop when he wasn't there, and I said, sorry, I missed you, Jack. I left a note. And I went a next time, a couple of weeks later when he wasn't there. Sorry, I missed you again, Jack Schaefer. So what do you think this guy's thinking? Who is this Jack Schaefer? Jack Who's Schaefer. this Jack Schaefer? The third time I went in, when he wasn't there, I put Jack Schaefer, and then I put my phone number. And I didn't even get back to the office before I got that call. You know, it was a cold call. So I got the cold call, and then I went to his shop when he was really busy. And I walked in and said, Jack Schaefer, FBI, and I, I showed him my creds. And, of course, if he's an agent, he's going to go into panic mode. And I, I want to talk to him when he's not in his panic mode. So mm -hmm. I says, I told him, I'll come back when you're not so busy. Mm -hmm. And when I did go back, he had calmed down and kind of readied himself for the interview. So then I said, why don't we walk down to the uh, a cafe that was a couple blocks away. And the reason I did that is to get him away from his uh, home turf where he mm -hmm. felt comfortable. And when we stroll, we, we are predisposed to talk. Because anytime we stroll with people or walk with people, we have a tendency to talk. And the second thing is, I went into this restaurant and I wanted to buy him something for several reasons. The first reason is 70% uh, of all information is shared over food and drink. So mm. think about the last time you shared information, it was sure. typically over sure. food and drink. The, the second reason I wanted to uh, set up reciprocity. If I buy him food and drink, and in this case coffee, mm -hmm. then he's going to have a predisposition to reciprocate by giving me something, and that's personal information. The third reason is I look at where he places his cup. If he places mm. his cup between me and him, that forms a barrier. That means he's not yet ready to talk. We haven't developed rapport strong enough for me to ask delicate questions. So I waited, and I developed rapport, and then I waited for the time where he took that coffee cup and he put it to one side. He took it away mm. from between us and put it to one side, and that signals that rapport had been developed. So those are all the reasons. And then he asked me, he says, so Mr. Schaefer, what do you want? I said, well, you called me. You must have something on your mind. What do you want to talk about? Oh, you have a subversive sense of humor. <laughs> well, that, it's exactly what happened. So we we uh, set up a lot of, uh, you know, strategies for interviewing people that give us the greatest probability of success. It's funny, you mentioned walking and what popped immediately in my mind is um, I've had Greg Hartley on multiple times. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Yeah, I work with Greg Hartley. Uh, okay. I know him quite well. <laughs> he was saying that all interrogation leads back to the Nazi Hans Scharf. Scharf. Yes, and that's, I, I gave a, a chapter on Hans in the, in the truth detector. Oh, I can't wait to read this. <laughs> he used elicitation techniques on the, the prisoners and got more information than the Gestapo did using uh, torture. Walk Fascinating, man. Walk he, he's, he's considered the, the, the grandfather of uh, elicitation. Well, and you know what's interesting is all the elicitation techniques are very familiar in the intelligence world because that's what mm -hmm. we thrive on. Those are our tools of the trade. But sure. very few people sure. outside the intelligence world realize the power of elicitation in learning about deals. When, they, when you go to buy a house, recently my wife and I were looking at a house, and we wondered if there was, uh, somebody told us that some of the houses have low water or high water levels and, and the basements tend to flood. So mm. if you ask a real estate person directly, does the basement flood? They probably say, well, there's no flooding issues, not that we know of. And you, you don't, they don't always tell you the truth, unfortunately. Sometimes they legally cannot, by the way. Uh, but sometimes they, they skirt around issues. And okay. so, well, we walked in the basement and I said, wow, they sure did a good job since, you know, repairing from the flood. <laughs> and, 
And he went, yeah, and they also put in a sump pump and did this and did that. And I said, okay, so the place does flood. So I got to the truth without without uh, asking a direct question. And I don't even think that real estate agent realized he gave up information. Probably not. I, I think I might have accidentally got that because I moved to Atlanta many years ago, and we were with an agent traveling from place to place to place. And legally they're not allowed to tell you certain things like if, or what the crime rate is in an area or schools or whatever because they can't prejudice you but what i noticed is that we went to this one place and she locked the car doors well there you go there's a clue <laughs> I, just, I said that's very uh, pretty high crime area here eh? uh oh and what i'm like well i noticed you locked your doors you never did that anywhere else uh oh yeah so you can yeah. that 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 would be a good use of elicitation. So the crime rate's high here. You see somebody lock the door. So oh, the crime rate's high here. What are they going to say? Yes or no? Or else, or else they have to go where I call the land of is, and that's that area between yes and no. And that was named after President Clinton's <laughs> famous answer. So that's another oh. way to to detect deception. If somebody, if you ask somebody a direct yes or no question and they refuse to answer yes or no, then they have to go to the area between yes or no, which is the land of is, where there's obfuscation, half-truths, innuendos, suppositions. And then what you want to do is if you don't get a yes or no answer, then you repeat the question, the yes or no question. And if they again take you to the land of is, the probability of deception skyrockets. You want to watch a good case of that. Watch Mark Zuckerberg's uh, testimony in front of Josh Hawley in, Cong in the Senate. Okay. Well, that's land of is. So oh, I, I, you, his. Well, I, I can sh I can share I can share another good technique that people might be interested in, and that's called the well technique. If you ask somebody a direct yes or no question, and they begin their response with the word well, it means they are about to tell you an answer they know you're not expecting. The example mm. I like to use is if I send my kid to, to do his homework in his room and I hear nothing but shenanigans going on, no homework, and then he comes out and I said, did you do your homework? And he says, well, that means he's going to give me an answer he knows I'm not expecting. Of course, the answer he thinks I'm expecting is, yes, Dad, I did my homework. <laughs> if he answers with the word well, it means he's going to give me an answer he knows I'm not expecting, which is anything but yes, which is what? No. So I say, go back in there and do your homework. Why well, you know I didn't do it, Dad? I'm in the FBI. Don't worry about it. Get in there and do it. <laughs> so if, if, you, if you ask your boss, am I getting a pay raise this year? Well, that means you're not getting a pay raise. You can use that well technique to test veracity of people without them even knowing that their veracity is being tested. That sounds similar or in the same category as the but as in everything before a but is irrelevant right and what was it mark mcclish who i've had on he's a statement analysis guy um he said he joked that they used to call that behold the underlying truth yes <laughs> okay i'll buy off on that <laughs> that was fun um to wrap things up this has been fantastic, and I, I want to deep dive as much as possible. I have a live stream where I bring in the audience into a live chat, and I was wondering if you might be available in the future to come on, say, with Robin Drake to answer you know, audience questions as well as maybe all chat together and, and dig into this. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be more than happy to do it. Okay, fantastic. Now. Everybody needs to rush out and get the like switch. If you haven't got it yet, get it, get it now, catch up. It's like back homework. And your new book, The Truth Detector, I've already bought it. I haven't read it. I'm super excited to get into that because that seems to tie right into more elicitation and everything that I'm really, really into. But I do enjoy the like switch, especially for establishing relationships and your friend signals. Um, in the days of COVID now with masks, 
the uh, eyebrow flash, the head cock, I think are especially valuable for making people feel comfortable when we're all a little bit frightened to begin with. Yeah, most of us uh, rely on the nonverbal cues. And when we put a mask on, we're severely limiting our ability to detect and evaluate nonverbal cues because we're missing out on almost half of them. Yeah, I'm trying to beat up the eyebrow flash. <laughs> well, you know, everybody I do, I go out of my way to go, eh, you know, just a, a, anything to calm down. Uh, well, you know, it's a long distance friend signal. And if you uh, approach people, and once I notify people or make them aware of the, the, the eyebrow flash, they say, I didn't realize, but I do this hundreds of times a day. And I go, yeah, you do. But I, how come I never <laughs> noticed it before? Well, it's kind of a semi-conscious uh, cue that tells other people we're friends. We're not a threat. So we do it automatically. But once you're yeah, aware you of it, then you can intentionally do it. Yeah, and you talked about the urban scowl. And I, I want to wrap it up on this because I have a weird theory. You could tell, tell me if I'm right or wrong. A lot of the most famous, likable people, say like Johnny Carson, are actually from the Midwest, if you will, or parts of the country where you know people are, are very open and friendly and engaging. Do you think that perhaps that sort of upbringing in the small town or open society could have been an um, unintentional or unrealized advantage to where they were performing all these techniques, even though they never realized they were taught these techniques? And going to New York, they're like, holy cow, this person is just really nice. Yeah, I think you're right, because I grew up in the south side of Chicago. And you have to walk around with the urban scowl so you, you don't become prey. Mm -hmm. And yet I met my, my future wife out in the suburbs. And I went out in the suburbs and all her friends thought I was mean. They didn't want to talk to me because I walked around in the suburbs with my urban scowl. And then when my wife mentioned it to me, I said, oh, I better get rid of the urban scowl because I'm in an environment where I don't have to be on guard from predators all the time. So once I realized that, then I was able to use it in different environments intentionally. So if you see a panhandler, give him the urban scowl. Don't look <laughs> at him. Don't give him an eyebrow flash. Don't smile. Don't do anything. Just walk right by with a stern face. Mm. And then they won't approach you at all. So you avoid a lot of situations okay. Okay. by knowing how to just what, what, what nonverbal cues to display in different situations. Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing that up because, you know, I'd be walking around always being, hey, look at me. And I used to get hit up by panhandlers all the time. Now I've got it to where um, I have headphones in. Whether they're on or off, they're always on. <laughs> I never <laughs> yeah. hear them. Hey, sir, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that works. <laughs> well, that's a cheat, but. Well, that's it. That's it. That's a, 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 a a shoot a offshoot of the uh the urban scowl you're just not giving anybody any attention and what it is it's it's negative attention you know it's it's i don't even want to hear you definitely definitely well jack this has been wonderful thank you so much